Hi there. In this video, I'm taking a closer look at two different principles used for measuring AC, true RMS and averaging. Originally, I planned this to be part of my review of the RS Pro RS14 multimeter. But then I decided it had wider applications, so it became a separate video instead. In fact, this video is more like a follow on on my How True Are True RMS Meters video, which you may want to watch before diving into this one. Here's my collection of handheld multimeters, slightly more organized. Some are true RMS and some are averaging. How to tell? Well, the true RMS meters make very sure to remind you by proudly writing true RMS somewhere on the front, although sometimes it's just written as TRMS. The aptly named Sinometer? No, not true RMS. And another giveaway is the presence of just 200 and 600 volt AC range and no AC current. This meter is many years old and I believe I got it from a bargain basket at Maplin for around 5 pounds. I grabbed two and to keep them apart I wrote a small number on it. This is number two, number one lives in the boot of my car. The RS Pro RS14? No, not true RMS, but compared to the Sinometer this has proper AC voltage and current ranges. This sells currently for £26 in the UK. The Aneng AN8008? Yes, True RMS is not only written under the selector switch, but also in the LCD to make sure you notice it. Banggood has this for less than £13. The Unity UT210E? Yes. Proudly proclaiming 2 RMS above the display and to make sure TRMS in the display. This sells currently for £36. The Primen BM235? Yes, at the top right corner under the BM235. This is of course the EEV block edition, but apart from the silk screening and the blue instead of red holster, this is just a standard BM235 which currently sells for £76 in the UK. The Bryman BM869S? Yes, at the very bottom you can see TRMS. This meter currently sells for £182 in the UK. For bench multimeters, true RMS is standard, so they usually don't need to brag about it on the front panel. But beware that in some older bench multimeters, the true RMS capability was sometimes an expensive extra option. So when you buy used kit, you need to do your homework and check that the apparent eBay bargain comes with the right option you want. So what is RMS or root mean square? Without going into the mathematics, one way to look at it is this. From using DC, we have become very attached to the very useful Ohm's law and how you calculate power. Although the voltage in an AC circuit is continuously changing from a positive peak to a negative peak and so is the current, it turns out there is a specific AC voltage such that when you use the same DC voltage to drive for example a heater or incandescent light bulb, it produces the same heat or light. This is the AC's RMS value. Mains uses a sine shape waveform and it turns out that for this waveform the RMS value is equivalent to the peak divided by the square root of 2 which is roughly 1.41. So if we talk about mains voltage, for example 230 volts, we are ignoring that the voltage in our wall outlet is actually cycling from minus 325 volts to plus 325 volts a great deal higher. But because 230 volts is the RMS value, for calculations on purely resistive loads our wall outlet can be treated as if it was delivering 230 volts DC instead. This is a 1 kilowatt heater and I want to measure RMS voltage and current using this highly dangerous setup. Please don't do this at home. It is running at 231.5 volts and draws 4.37 amps. Because it's RMS and the heater is essentially a big resistor, 
we can multiply these and get 1013 or so watts. There's a slight error here because the fan motor draws a couple of extra watts. If we divide the measured RMS value of 231 volts by 4.37 amps, we get about 52 ohms. And that bears roughly out when measuring the DC resistance across the block. All very bread and butter calculations that rely on the concept of RMS. For a sine wave, RMS depends only on the peak value, so whether you measure mains voltage, the output of a 12 volt transformer, or a sine wave of 1 kHz coming from your audio amplifier doesn't matter. In this test, all 6 meters are connected in parallel to mains voltage. You can see the mains frequency, about 50 Hz in Europe, on the dual display on the right. All meters are basically in agreement and even the RS14 as the worst is still within 1%. If all your AC measurements are household mains, there's no need for true RMS. But RMS depends, of course, on the shape of the waveform. One of the simplest waveforms is the square wave, with 50% duty cycle, meaning the positive part, has exactly the same duration as the negative part. Something like that you find often in DC to AC power converters. Its RMS value or the equivalent DC value is very easy to understand because the same as the peak voltage. The reason is quite obvious. The square wave is mostly DC already, except that it reverses polarity once in every cycle. In the negative cycle, the voltage is negative, but so is the current, and so the power as the product is again positive. This is the same setup as before, but now 4 meters read about 208 volts, while 2 read much higher, 230 volts or so. Using a square wave with 50% duty cycle is a great way to test if a meter is true RMS or not. If it reads the peak voltage, here 208 volts, it is true RMS. If it is 10% higher, it's averaging. You can use lower voltages, of course. To understand why this happens, you need to understand how true RMS and averaging multimeters work in principle. On the top here, we have a true RMS meter and below that an averaging one. Both the true RMS and averaging meter take an AC signal and convert it to DC for display scaled in such a way that the readout corresponds to the AC value. In both meters, the incoming signal is AC coupled that is connected through a capacitor to block unwanted DC components. True RMS converters do quite a bit of signal processing. The input signal needs to be conditioned, then squared, then averaged, followed by a square root operation. It is quite a process, although much of it is now integrated, which is why you find true RMS capability even in cheaper meters. Despite all this effort, the value shown by true RMS meter is not always the true RMS, as I have shown in a recent video, and the problem lies with the capacitor at the front end. What your true RMS meter shows is the AC part of the true RMS. If there is a DC part, to get the true RMS you need to geometrically add AC and DC parts as in this formula here. Some meters like my Bryman BM869S have the capability to do this automatically. If you don't have a meter like that, you need to measure DC and AC individually and then use your calculator to get the true RMS. Let's leave the true and not quite true RMS converter and look at the circuit in the averaging multimeter. It can be as simple as a full bridge rectifier. This really harks back from the early days of mechanical meters and presents the simplest answer to the question of how to measure AC with a DC meter. Simple, run it through a rectifier. And the inertia of the needle will take care of the averaging. With digital meters you need only slightly more effort. It is not quite as simple as connecting a capacitor across the rectified DC as in the upper diagram, which we all recognize as being a standard part of any DC power supply. As the load, in this case a DC multimeter, has a very high input impedance in the Mac ohm range, 
the socket is basically not loaded and the capacitor will charge up to the peak voltage. Compare this with the diagram below. I actually built this circuit using a 741 op amp to get the scope picture. The op amp is wired as a buffer. In, that is, its output follows the input one to one. Instead of amplification in this mode, an op amp provides a very high input resistance and a very low output resistance, and the low output is crucial for this. You see, when the voltage rises, current flows out of the op amp and start charging the capacitor. The voltage on the capacitor follows with some delay because of the 10k resistor. Once the halfway has reached its peak and starts dropping, it will eventually fall below the voltage of the capacitor has reached at the moment and start discharging. The current flow reverses and goes back into the op amp. Over many periods, the capacitor voltage will be exactly the average value. The difference to the upper diagram is that there, once the halfway voltage drops below the capacitor voltage, there's no way for the capacitor to discharge. The current can't flow back through either of the two diodes in the full bridge rectifier. The only way for the capacitor to discharge is through the load resistor on the other side and if that's very high, the capacitor will simply stay at peak voltage. One last note on these schematics. Of course, better digital averaging multimeters don't use a simple full bridge rectifier at the input because of the voltage drop across the diodes. They use another couple of op amps to create a precision rectifier, but the principle is still the same. Here's the circuit on the lower diagram you just saw on a breadboard. You can see the op amp, two resistors and the capacitor. I connected two scope probes to measure the input and output. The yellow trace is the input and the blue the output. The voltages for both are measured and shown by the scope. Within tolerances the blue value is the exact average of the input. Because of the low output resistance of the op amp, the capacitor is forced to follow when I lower the input voltage. Of course, for a real averaging meter, you would choose a smaller cap that can follow faster, but I thought it's more fun to see the averaging circuit hard at work. The same happens, of course, when I raise the input voltage. Now that we know how to produce it, what exactly is the average value of a familiar sine wave? After rectification, of course, because before that it's zero as positive and negative halfway cancel each other. We know its RMS value is V peak divided by the square root of 2. If we run this wave through the full bridge rectifier, all that happens is that the negative halfway gets flipped upwards to become positive instead. As an interesting side effect, this actually doubles the frequency. For the same reason I explained, when looking at the square wave earlier, ohms law, power and so on are not the least affected by this operation, so the RMS value of a full bridge rectifier sine wave stays the same, V peak divided by the square root of 2. What changes instead is the average value. Instead of the positive halfway getting cancelled out by the negative one, after a full bridge rectifier we have only positive halfways and we get a positive average, which happens to be 2 times v peak divided by pi. What this red line represents is the mathematical average over a period and an average multimeter uses a circuit like I just showed to get it. The key point is, the averaging meter sits behind its rectifier an averaging capacitor and therefore no longer sees the actual waveform and its RMS. Instead, it sees only averaged values. For a sine wave, we can calculate that the RMS over the average is a constant. Pi over 2 times the square root of 2, or about 1.1107. Crucially, this factor is not depending on voltage or frequency, 
because historically all practical AC was in the form of sine waves. So what the scalar in an average meter does, it multiplies the average by 1.11 and displays the result as its best attempt at RMS. This works great for sine waves, but um, not so well for anything else. In the case of our humble square wave with 50% duty cycle, we know the RMS value is actually V-peak. Running this waveform through a full bridge rectifier simply flips the negative part up and now we have actually smooth DC voltage of V-peak value and of course the average of that smooth value is again V-peak. Unfortunately, the averaging meter doesn't know that the average it sees is now produced by a square wave, so it applies the only correction factor it knows, that for sine waves, to everything. As a result, it shows a value that is 1.11 times or about 11% too large. Which is exactly what we saw earlier when comparing true RMS and averaging meters. So the key difference between an averaging and a true RMS meter is that for an averaging meter everything is a sine wave and if it's not the results are generally wrong by a varying amount which can get quite large. For non-sine wave forms the averaging meter shows a false RMS. A true RMS meter instead produces an accurate result of the AC part of the RMS taking the waveform into account. Note the highlighted AC part. This can cause an issue if there is a large DC part and you are not aware of it. Here is such a case. If you just look at the averaging meter on the right, a voltage of just shy of 18 volts AC isn't that bad. But because this is not a sine wave, the combined RMS is actually more than 85 volts, enough to give you a very nasty surprise. Yet in this case, as the second display on the meter on the right shows, a normal AC true RMS meter would also just read 36.7 volts. While that's at least double the averaging meter, it is still deceptively low and could get you into trouble. Incidentally, the square wave in this test is generated by the AC converter box, the building of which is going to be in one of the next videos. Unfortunately, in this day and age of pulse width modulation and switch mode power supplies, such waveforms are now common and pure sine waves are becoming the minority. So I thought it might be interesting to investigate what different waveforms do to true RMS and averaging meters, but the math behind it gets pretty dense very quickly. So I thought about a better way and developed a waveform analyzer. And the best part is that you can download it from my GitHub page and do experiments yourself. But since this video is pretty long already, I stop here and introduce the waveform analyzer in the second part. Until then, thanks for watching this part.